This is a rebellion, isn't it? I call it aggressive negotiations. The garbage will do! Hi, and welcome to the Trash Compactor Podcast, a discussion of Star Wars from the female perspective. I'm MC, and I'm here with... This is Roan. This is our second episode, and we want to thank everyone for listening to our premiere and for the feedback we've received from it. In this episode, we'll be discussing the generations of Star Wars fandom. We'll look at fan work wrecks based on the different sections of the fandom, plus news and our spotlight. But first, I want to talk about something that has become a very popular topic of conversation, and that's the Machete Order. Yeah, you know, I, I hadn't heard of this until, I think, just a couple of months ago. I had no idea it was such a big thing. Yeah, I think in like the last year or so, it has become fashionable, or somebody had actually come up with this idea of, for those of you who don't know, the machete order is a way to preserve the surprise of the big spoiler from the end of The Empire Strikes Back. And if you don't know that, I don't really know why you're listening to this. (laughs) But basically, you watch A New Hope, and then you watch The Empire Strikes Back, and then you go into the prequels, and you watch them as a um, flashback. And you can skip over The Phantom Menace and just go into Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith and just experience Anakin's downfall. And then you finish off with Return of the Jedi, which is his redemption. So... How do we feel about this machete order? Well, you know, I I have actually done it. I mean, I I sat down and I like marathoned it. I sat down over a couple of days and just watched everything. And I've actually done it a couple of times because I'm that much of a geek. (laughs) Um, One time I skipped Phantom Menace and one time I didn't skip Phantom Menace. I was going to ask, which way works better? Well... It really depends. Like, if you're an absolute completist like I am, it always feels kind of weird to skip anything. Yeah. But, I mean, the jump to go from arguably the best movie in the series, Empire Strikes (laughs) Back, and then jump straight to Phantom Menace, which is (laughs) arguably not the best movie (laughs) in the series, um, that's a rough jump. It's rough. But how does it work from... um empire to attack the clones it's not as bad um i I think for me the appeal was uh we'll have to link to the article where the guy like initially talks about this um his name is lost to the internet i'm sure it's out there somewhere but i was really curious how the emotional heft of it was you know where you get the whole i am your father and everything's kind of a major downer at the end of uh, of empire and then you go back and you see this guy when he was young before he was evil um and you kind of see his downfall. And it really, I, I honestly think that plus watching the Clone Wars, it, it kind of gave me a whole new appreciation for Anakin's story and for the emotional weight of it to see, we see him going, you know, from, you know, I am your father to this kid, literally this kid, if you watch Phantom Menace. Mm hmm. And you kind of see his evolution. And so when we finally roll back around to Jedi, I I don't know, it was almost like I I could see a little bit clearer what it was that Luke was seeing in him. Mm -hmm. But it it, it really was, it's an interesting way to tie everything together. It it really, it makes it feel more of a whole than if you just, you know, watch the two trilogies back to back. Um, So I would definitely recommend if you haven't done this, sit down and do it and Feel free to skip Phantom Menace because honestly, from a story perspective, like just for the, you know, the story of, of Anakin falling and being redeemed, yeah, it doesn't add a whole lot. Yeah, I mean, like, I've watched uh, fan edits that have, you know, excised most of the Phantom Menace. Uh, basically, they mostly only keep in the fight at the end because it's cool. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the only thing that's really missing, if you leave out the Phantom Menace, is the establishment of the Anakin and Padme relationship. 
But I mean, that you don't really get all that much from the Phantom Menace, just like, oh, this was their first meeting. And the only other thing is Anakin's relationship with his mother. Yeah, which... you definitely, you lose Shmi, which is bad. Yeah. Um, you also lose Qui-Gon, which is bad. Yes, because, you know, Liam Neeson. Um, I, <laughs> yeah. I just looked up, um, the Machete Order was, uh, innovated let's say by a guy named rod hilton oh, there you go. and he did it back in 2011 wow. which was a surprising long time ago because i've only been hearing about it in the last year or two so yeah i wonder what caused the spike interesting reddit probably, probably. um <laughs> and, and you know while we're talking about different ways to watch the trilogy i have to throw in a plug for harmy's despecialized version of the original trilogy um you can just google that and if i can find a link we'll stick the link in the show notes this guy has gone through and taken the original trilogy and basically restored it to as close to the original theatrical releases as he could get um that means like all the extra scenes from the specialized special editions are gone all the new special effects that some of them really didn't age very well um those are gone and the thing that totally messed me up the first time I watched Harmy's special edition, uh, despecialized edition for the first one, is not seeing the episode for A New Hope in. I know, like, yeah, because the, in the first theatrical release, that wasn't there. Yeah, um, but I've never seen it without it because I was did not exist at the time. So, <laughs> oh, that's right, you're just a baby. <laughs> um, so yeah, it definitely, it, it's worth looking at. In fact, I. That's pretty much the only version I watch at this point. I have the others and I've watched them and it, it's really jarring to me, especially the I will never get over the end of Return of the Jedi. It's so different. <laughs> I can't deal with how different it is. It's just justice for yub nub. Yeah, that's right. It's our, it's our closing theme for a reason. Damn yeah. it. And uh, they did release the um unspecialized versions on uh dvd uh, a couple years ago did they but th uh they did uh, like a six movie set but it was by six movies i mean they did special edition a new hope and then regular edition a new hope huh I didn't and know that was it is a a terrible a terrible quality version of it and actually harmy talks about it in his notes for the specialized version because he has used them as a source but they they need to be cleaned up so much because i think it's like just a rip of an old laser disc if i remember correctly. yeah oh yeah i remember reading so, about that now yeah really not very well preserved and i've tried to watch it and i was like oh this looks bad and so harmy has just put a lot of work into actually while taking out the special effects still making the movies look good yeah and they really do i mean they're they're like they're dvd quality easily i don't know george lucas is probably somewhere screaming i'm sure he's not a fan but yeah well george lucas doesn't own the star wars movies anymore <laughs> now. they belong to disney who actually now that i think about it it's more litigious so mm. you know we're, we're not advocating that anybody download any versions of the you know the star wars movies that aren't officially bought all hail our lord and master <laughs> mickey you can, mouse you can you can download the the fan editions after you've bought the original ones there you go. yes it's yes, fair yes. use uh, i will argue yes. till the death that it's fair use yes <laughs> it's a parody no wait not quite <laughs> so yeah so this episode we're kind of looking at everything yeah there's just this star wars world has been around for so long now that uh it's been able to create little mini fandoms and we just want to look at you know how they all interact with each other i am excited about this round table i, I think it's going to be utter madness but i think it's going to be a lot of fun yes so let's dive into the show with the news great this is MC, and this is what's happening in the galaxy. 
Entertainment Weekly for July 1st has a cover story on Rogue One. The exclusive story gives names to the Imperial Transports, AT-ACTs, and TIE Strikers. They also provided new information about Jen Erso and the other Rebels, including character names and brief descriptions. Forrest Whitaker has been revealed to be playing Saw Guerrera, a character last seen in the fifth season of Star Wars, The Clone Wars. EW also spoke to the filmmakers about the reshoots that have been rumored for the past month and what they will be adding to the film. Probably the most anticipated rumor was finally confirmed as it was announced Darth Vader would be appearing in the movie and his first day on the set was covered, as well as what his return would mean to the Star Wars universe. In mid-June, Movie Pilot reported on a painting by Lucasfilm licensed artist Brudel Gonzalez. Gonzalez's painting of Rey was displayed at the Solaire Resort and Casino in Manila, entitled Rey Skywalker, leading many to believe Rey's parentage was leaked. Pablo Hidalgo reported on Twitter that licensees were not given that level of spoilers. StormtrooperLarry.com reached out to the artist, who reported the painting was actually entitled Rey, but was accidentally retitled Rey Skywalker. Star Wars Battlefront has updated with new downloadable content, adding five Bespin maps to the action shooter. Along with the maps are new hero characters, Lando Calrissian and Dengar, a cloud car vehicle, and new game mode, Sabotage. The DLC is available now for players with a season's pass and for everyone on July 5th. LEGO Star Wars The Force Awakens arrived on June 28th. The game covers the events of Star Wars The Force Awakens. It allows you to play as Rey, Finn, Poe, Kylo Ren, Han Solo, and BB-8. Prior to release, character spotlights were released on various characters, including one on Kylo Ren, showing him with a bedroom covered in Darth Vader merchandise. On Instagram, Daisy Ridley opened up about her personal experience with endometrius and polycystic ovary syndrome. She urged fans to get themselves tested if they had physical discomfort. Ridley later Instagrammed on her disastrous DIY facial mask made of turmeric, which dyed her face and hands yellow the night before a Star Wars shoot. In an interview with the Toronto Sun promoting the BFG, Steven Spielberg said he would never direct a Star Wars movie. He told reporters, That's not my genre. It's certainly my buddies, the Thomas Edison of science fiction, George Lucas, who created the entire series. But that was never for me. I'm just a fan. That's all for the Trash Compactor News. Links to more information on the stories we've reported on can be found in the show notes. If you have any tips, email us at the Trash Compactor Podcast at gmail.com. And now for this month's spotlight, the humble slave that begat the most notorious and powerful dynasty in the galaxy. Much of Shami Skywalker's history is a mystery. One legend tells of her being kidnapped by pirates and sold into slavery at the age of six. In her 20s, she found herself inexplicably pregnant. She gave birth to her son, Anakin, and raised him while a slave of Gardula the Hutt. Both Skywalkers were later lost in a wager to Watto. When Qui-Gon Jinn and Padme Amidala were stranded on Tatooine, Shimmy offered them sanctuary. Qui-Gon discovered the circumstances of Anakin's birth and wished to take him to study the Jedi arts. Shimmy was reluctant, but knew the Jedi could offer a better life than she ever could. Years after Anakin's departure, Shimmy met Klee Glars and fell in love with him. He bought her from Watto, emancipating and marrying her. While she still pined for her son, she found some degree of happiness as wife to Klee and stepmother to Owen. Shimmy's happiness came to an abrupt end when marauding Tusken Raiders kidnapped her. Her pain radiated through the Force, calling Anakin to her. She died in his arms, causing his anger to grow and push him closer to the dark side. While Shimmy's contribution to the Skywalker family is largely unknown, in the Legends timeline, her granddaughter, Leia Organa Solo, would find her hollow diary, chronicling her life after Anakin's departure from Tatooine, and give the princess a different view into the man who would become Darth Vader. Welcome to our main segment for this episode, where we're going to be talking about four different generations of the Star Wars fandom, what we love about them, how we got involved, and so on. 
I'm Roan, and I'm going to be talking about the original trilogy. And with me here, I have... I'm MC. I'm going to be talking about the late lamented expanded universe. I'm Emma, and I'm going to be talking about uh, the prequels, Phantom Menace era. And I'm April, and I will be talking about the sequel. Yay! We're excited to have April back with us this month, and we also have our special guest, Emma. Well, to kick this off, I guess the first thing to, to ask is, what drew you to this particular segment of the Star Wars universe? Because there, I mean, there's so much to it. It's such a vast media empire at this point. So, like, what drew what what draws you to this one segment, and what makes it different from the others? Okay, well, with me, it was uh, it was 1995, so there were lots of books coming out in the expanded universe, and there was not a lot going on with anything else. Yeah, that was the biggest thing. It was it was content that was being you know that was coming out at the time. So, and it was really easy to get my hands on. Like I could go to the um, to the convenience store and find uh, novels coming out. So, yeah, the the dim dark days when we thought there were going to be no more movies ever. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I know for me, I'm. I mean, I started young. I saw Star Wars at a drive-in in 1977, and it's like one of the most vivid memories of my early childhood. I mean, I can like put myself back in that car, staring at the screen, and of course, Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi were like my childhood completely. Um, and I mean, Return of the Jedi was like puberty for me (laughs) um um, and yeah i mean it just it it kind of kicked the whole thing off and it it stayed with me for christ nearly 40 years now oh my story is very much like rowan's i i think i was in the next car over at the (laughs) drive-in and um my parents i was like six years old at the time and my parents i think thought that my sister and i were just going to fall asleep in the back of our station wagon with the oh my god because my best friend seriously (laughs) my best friend was with us and she totally fell asleep but i kept looking at her like what is wrong with you (laughs) oh yeah yeah so my sister fell asleep and i didn't i just sat there with wide eyes watching it through like the you know from the back seat of the car and uh and, and it was also it was a huge obsession for me when it when star wars came on hbo um it was the, I'm like, are oh, you going back? We're so old, right? There were, there were, you couldn't have it. There was no digital downloads. Right. There was no BHS fucking cassettes, right? I mean, like, you had to wait until someone showed it someday. And so I had, like, this book and record back before even cassette tapes. I had this book and record thing, and they would <gasps> ding, and you would turn the page, right? Yes. But it was missing, like, half the plot. And I remembered the garbage masher scene, but it wasn't in my book and record. And so when I finally, like, a couple of years later, it seemed like an eternity later because I was like 11, but like a couple of years later, like 1980, I think when it came on HBO and I got to stay up late to watch it, I was like, I knew there was a garbage measure. I knew that that scene was in there. It was, you know, anyway. <laughs> so like I was like, bro, it just, it was like my, my childhood and my teen years. And I, um, and I was like a huge, like Luke Leia shipper. I remember seeing the poster for the Empire Strikes Back yes! and just like screaming at the sight of Han kissing Leia. Like I screamed. Mm-hmm. I was like nine or how old was I? Eight, nine. I don't know. But I was like, no, because my ship just kind of got torpedoed. So yeah, so I think we were kind of separated at birth in that way. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm actually here to talk about, oh, and then like, you know, as, um, as was just said, I also read all the EU books because... There was nothing else. <laughs> I was still a Star Wars fan. Um, and so when um, uh, when the prequel films came out, I was actually in graduate school, and I didn't have time to do much more than go to them and go, huh, Jar Jar. Okay. And then go back to study more. <laughs> but um, so what happened with me with the, the prequels fandom was that I actually turned in my dissertation. And the next day, I went to see Attack of the Clones, because it had been out for a couple of weeks at that point. And then I was like, I'm going to get online and because by this point there was internet, right? Fast mm-hmm. forward a thousand years. And I got online and immediately encountered Qui-Gon Obi-Wan slash and just went, Oh fuck, this is where I'm meant to be. <laughs> like I didn't know I that explicit know. slash fic existed of Star Wars characters. Like I had written some in a little notebook and shoved it under my bed. Right. But like, I didn't know whether people did it. And so it was my first big slash fandom. And I spent a few glorious years there. Um, okay, so I guess for me, so I was born in 79, so, and my mother is hugely into sci-fi and fantasy, and I have a brother that's three years older than me, so all of those sort of coalesced that Star Wars was in my life, like, my entire life. Um, and I do vaguely remember, like, 
waiting for the movies to come out, like, as far as on television, because we didn't have a VCR until probably, like, 1988, something like that. Right. Um, and so it was just always there. And then I remember getting very excited when the um, prequels were coming out, though I didn't follow it online so much. Um, I just had a friend who I worked with at the video store who was hugely into it, too. And we went to see The Phantom Menace at a midnight showing because I was going to England the next day and the movie actually opened in the U S first. So I was like, I'm not going to wait a week <laughs> on this. <laughs> and, um, so I sure though my whole experience was like, I was very excited about the Phantom Menace, but it, there was nothing about it that made me sort of want to find out more. And I was, as far as online, I was more into music fandoms for a very long time. Um, so then with this, with the force awakens, it was kind of weird because I very much like, was in denial that it was actually happening i think for a very long time even if it's i was too started shooting yeah so i didn't it wasn't like right now i wasn't trying to find any spoilers or anything if pictures came out i was just like okay cool that's a thing and then it came out i didn't get to actually see it until christmas day so i was just like on tinder hooks for that whole week trying to avoid spoilers and i the one there was only one that because some numb nuts uh tagged a uh, gif of Kylo Ren as Ben Solo <laughs> and didn't tag uh, it. Oh or no! Yeah, but that, uh. as far as all the spoilers, that was fine because, like, with all the clues, I probably would have figured it out anyway. But I just, I get in the theater, I'm sitting there with my husband, the freaking crawl starts, and I burst into tears. <laughs> so did I! <laughs> it was just like. I could it, not watch that crawl! Yeah, I cried when we first saw the Millennium Falcon. Like, Obviously, I cried in all the sad parts, too, but... Um, so, yeah, this was... Since I was already involved in other online fandoms and everybody sort of had the same interest, it was very easy to just fall into being really excited about this and the new characters and where we're going from here. And I was just so glad that it was a good movie. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So I know. That's, yeah. So that's it, I guess. Oh, one thing, too. My um, husband is not into Star Wars. He think He thought the OT was very boring and hated the prequels. But he actually liked he actually liked the Force Awakens, so that was kind of amazing. Ah. It's a mixed marriage. I don't know. <laughs> <It's a pun. laughs> so, wow, I'm like drowning in nostalgia now. Um, so, thinking about think, thinking about your your thing, what is if you had to pick one? And Jesus, I didn't think of an answer to this, so I'm gonna have to think about this. Uh, if you had to pick one, what is your favorite moment? I think for me, and so, and I'm talking about the uh, the prequel trilogy here. Um, I think coming from you know having seen the original trilogy and having read all the books and, and the EU books now Legends, um, one of the things that that happened in there was prior to like 1997, no one had a fucking clue, right? What happened before, and oh, so there was like know. some. It was almost like this whole like swath of history just hadn't happened. Like no one knew shit about the old Republic or how the Jedi operated or anything, which in retrospect seems really strange, but like, you know, so there was all the stuff about, you know, Luke trying to figure out how to train new Jedi. He had no clue because there were no records. There was nothing. And so just the first moment when Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan come onto the screen in the Phantom Menace and they're just fucking invincible. Like, they keep going and they keep going and they keep and like they keep sending more like droids at them and more deadly things. They try to poison them and all this shit. And like there's this one guy who's just like, we're going to die. We're going to die. Like we're not going to survive this. And you think, oh, come on. <laughs> They're sending all these droids at these two guys. But I can't – for people who saw The Phantom Menace before they saw the other trilogy or, or who don't – who weren't old enough to have lived through that previous period, I just can't impress upon you how amazing it was to see the Jedi in their glory – like that, uh, that's like my best, and I still my best moment in that movie. There's a lot of shit I hate in that movie. But, you know, that moment where they're just invincible. It's like, that's the Jedi. That's the Jedi at their prime. Oh, I love it. Yeah, that was really cool. Okay, well, I think for me, probably my uh, favorite moment was, uh, and actually a book that is not like the best, but um, I love the wedding of Han Solo and Princess Leia in the courtship of Princess oh, Leia. Because yes. I knew you were going to pick that book. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like the culmination of like, because I did not, you know, grow up seeing, I saw all of the movies at once because I'm a bit younger than everybody else. So uh, Han and Leia were always my OTP. So actually seeing them get married 
was, you know, such a powerful moment. And then the other moment that I really loved, and I think Rome will love this one too, it's um, Luke taking care of Han and Leia's kids and doing an impersonation of Yoda. Oh my god! What book is that in? I need to know. Um, I think it's in Jedi Search, which is okay. again, not a great book, but that moment just kind of makes it all worth it. I think if I have to nail it down, it's going to be something from Return of the Jedi because, damn it, that's my favorite. I don't care. Um, Ewoks and all. Ewoks and all. I don't care. I love the Ewoks. I was 11. Come on. <laughs> um, gosh, I'm torn between um, the scene with Luke and Leia in Endor when he tells her that she's his sister. Mm. Um, just because that's it's just it's such an emotional scene and. I, I already knew at that point that my ship was dead. And so I was just happy to see them talking to each other. Um, but um, I, I just, I don't know. I just, I, I get very emotional about that scene. It just because there's just so much going on. And I guess on the opposite end of the spectrum, like the whole, like, badassery of, of Luke finally being a Jedi. And again, I'm I'm, I'm talking about 11 year old me here. But I swear to you, that summer, we um, I, we had a pool in our backyard, and I swear to you, we spent that whole damn summer trying to recreate that flip <laughs> off the off the sail barge from 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 Tatooine. So that's probably my other favorite. So obviously, the snow fight, and there's a lot of moments <gasps> yes. in there. But I'd say in the snow, because the snow fight is just it's extraordinary. It's beautiful. I was so amazed to find out that was a sound that, that was a set on a sound stage. Um, so within that, though, is the moment that Ray calls the lightsaber. Like <gasps> that's just incredible for yeah. women everywhere. For me, for like it was fantastic. Um, but then, other than that, is the moment when the resistance arrives on Takadana. Because yes, yeah, it's just such. It's a moment of hope and like. The music is so fantastic there, and the visual is great with them coming across the water, and the you know, starfighters are making the the water like rise up, and like we find out Poe is alive. You know, it's just all oh, it was so wonderful, and I think yeah, that probably is much. As there's all this other stuff that's great. That moment is just so fantastic. That was a, just a really Star Warsy. Yeah, type it's so Star mm -hmm. Wars. <laughs> it's just like oh look, they got here in the nick of time. Yes. Well, of course, if, if we're talking about what your favorite moment is, we have to talk about, you know, who's your favorite character. And again, you have to limit yourself to your own particular segment. And I know it's going to be hard for some of you. Jeez, Rowan, I think I can guess maybe who your favorite character is. I'm, I'm not sure, though. Shut up. Hmm. I'm going to surprise you all. It's Yoda. No. <laughs> Okay, fine. I'll go first. My favorite character, obviously, to anyone who has ever looked at my blog ever, is Luke Skywalker. Um, I, I fell in love with him when I was five. You don't get over that sort of thing. Uh, he just is... I, I've seen a post on Tumblr going around, and I'll have to find it and link to it, because it, it kind of says everything. That he is... He's a hero without being a hyper-masculine hero. Like, he he's not he's not what you would expect the hero of a of a fantasy trilogy to be. Like he's not Conan the Barbarian. He's not, um, you know, like if if they tried to if they tried to make those movies now, um, they would expect some. Well, I mean, because they're doing it now with with Daisy Ridley and and John Boyega, is you know they would have him bulking up more. Um, yeah, he doesn't look like he does on the original poster. It, God. <laughs> you mean the original poster where he does look like Conan the Barbarian? Yes. Um, but, you know, so we have this guy who, who is kind of the, the unexpected hero. And his whole thing is that he's very sweet and he's very kind. And, I mean, he saves the day because he loves his father. And, I mean, how do you not love that? And Mark Hamill is a pretty awesome guy all yeah, around. So yeah. it, doesn't, it doesn't hurt. Good God, don't get me started on that subject. <laughs> <laughs> we will be here all day. Surprisingly, my favorite character in the EU is not Mara Jade. <gasps> um, it's actually uh, Tenelka Dijot. 
oh. uh, who was introduced in uh, the Young Jedi Knights books and later on came back and was... I like to think of her as Padme done right. Um, <laughs> Because there's so many, um, there's a lot of parallels between her relationship uh, with Jason and Anakin's relationship with Padme. But instead of falling apart, she kind of rises to the occasion. But probably my, the reason why she's my favorite is there's one book in the Young Jedi Knight series called Lightsabers. And uh, in, uh, in the Star Wars movies, of course, it's a huge joke having uh, limbs cut off. Just it's right. all over the place. It's a running gag. Uh, lightsabers is all about how Tenelka is in a lightsaber accident and has her arm cut off, and it's actually taken seriously. Um, uh, she goes through you know what a horrific loss this is, and you know trying to come to terms with it. And by the end of it, it's not all fixed in the oh, I'm just going to have, you know, a prosthesis that is magical and looks exactly like my own arm. She actually comes to terms with that I'm going to be a person with one arm and I'm going to deal with it. And I thought that was very strong for her character. So um, she's just a, an incredibly self-possessed character and was just so awesome. I mean, she's from, you know, uh, people who tame rancors. Uh, so oh, right. Yeah, she um, is uh, from. Uh, Rowan has. I made her read Courtship of Princess Leia. So oh, yeah, she you, is from you had to the... twist my arm. I think your exact words were some people call this book the erotic adventures of Luke Skywalker. And I think I <laughs> yes. bought it about 30 seconds later. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think that's exactly the words I used. Yeah, I, I one clicked um, before you finished saying it. She's uh, just a character that I. I felt was outside of the Skywalker, you know, main, you know, family, but still kind of adjacent because eventually she does kind of end up in the middle of things. Uh, so she doesn't have all of that baggage tied to her where she seemingly you know, like, you know, a child of, you know, any of the main characters, but she still managed to hold her own. So that was why she was my favorite. Um, so I really can't decide, <laughs> which is not like favorites are like horrible for me um so it because it always comes down to i'll be like oh obviously finn is my favorite character because he's so brave and so loyal and takes this huge journey from what he was raised to do and what he eventually becomes um you know and from wanting to run away from the first order to staring death in the face in the form of Kylo Ren was just incredible but then i think but ray and her tenacity and her just she's such a survivor and she's so brave everything that happens to her when you also think about it in the context of her being somebody who had lived the same pattern with her life over and over for years and years and for then all of this to happen and her to come out of it the way she did is incredible um but then i'm like i obviously am also for the first time in my life into a villain so i'm like super intrigued by kylo ren so yeah i i just can't every time i think yes I have a favorite, then something else comes up. And I'm like, no, but this character. So I, I think you've got an interesting situation in that the force awakens all three of those characters. You could make an argument for there being a hero's journey for them. So depending on your point of view, they could be the main character. It just, you know, kind of depends on how you're looking at things at the moment. So I can see why it would be hard to choose between them. So taking us back in time, um, I this is probably not going to surprise anyone either, but um, it has to be Obi-Wan, who is my problematic fave character mm -hmm. in Star Wars. Um, <laughs> problematic for many reasons, but I, I think that I find him really fascinating because he, he was in, you know, the prequels and in, I mean, he was in all six, you know, the first six films, obviously, in some capacity. Um, and he, you know, so if you've read the Jedi Apprentice books, you see that he had really a rough start. I mean, he almost didn't get chosen as a Padawan at all. And um, so the fact that he ended up being Qui-Gon's Padawan was kind of a, a stroke of luck and sort of, you know, the force, whatever, right? So he, um, he worked really hard and he believed very much in what the Jedi stood for. And he, and even though Qui-Gon was kind of a rebel, Obi-Wan spent, you know, a lot of the Jedi apprentice years trying to sort of encourage Qui-Gon to trust in the 
the Jedi Council and do all these things. And, and Obi-Wan really put his trust in that. And he did everything he was supposed to do. And then it all went to hell anyway. And he was, you know, along with Yoda, was pretty much the lone survivor. So this guy who put all of his trust, all of his faith in the system got fucked by the system. And then he's left alone trying to pick up the pieces and watch over this baby on this desert planet all alone. If anyone's read Kenobi, which I think came out last year, it does an incredible job of just portraying the the bleakness that he feels and everything that's happened. Um, but he, so he lives this monastic existence and he goes on. I mean, he has this incredible trajectory as a character. But then at the end, you know, he's, he kind of has to let go. Um I mean, well, literally, well, physically and literally, you know, he, he lets go. But even when he's, you know, when he's, you know, blue ghost Obi-Wan, he still is struggling with this loyalty to the way things he thinks things should be and the direction that Luke is going. And I don't know if he ever really comes to terms with the fact that things have to change. He, you know, even in the end, he's kind of arguing with Luke, don't do it, don't go, or, you know, you have to do this and that. You have to defeat, you have to kill Vader in order for this to happen. And, you know, and so I think that it's very interesting to me that um, that he kind of, in the end, loses everything that he that he holds dear, including his beloved master, which if we want to get into shipping, I can also talk about. Um, so I guess, you know, since we're all we're all fangirls here and I think we all all ship to one extreme or another, some of us more extreme than others. Uh, what are your favorite ships in your particular segment? Okay, well, um, I am a multi-shipper by heart, um, so I am sort of, like, I've been riding um, Raylo more, but I've also, like, I'm super into Finn and Rey, um, and it's very interesting because every time I see the movie, I just come out of it with just like, oh my god, Finn and Rey, they're going to make the most beautiful babies <laughs> together, they're just going <laughs> to fly off into the sunset. And then I start thinking, and then I'm like, oh, but Kylo Ren and Rey. <laughs> like, it's just, like, you know, one of the things, I think what I told my best friend was, I was like, so yeah, Finn and Rey, I want to see them happy in the movies and right off into the sunset together. But in fic, I just want to see Kylo and Rey fucking and fighting across the galaxy. Like, that's <laughs> sort of my thing. So... I and, think you just um, summed up the appeal of that ship for me right there. <laughs> yeah. And so, and I, and I, I don't know if I, the whole cousins question, I don't know how I will feel about that if that happens to happen. So we'll just, I just table that. I'm like, that's a long time from now. You well, know? let me tell you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. But, um, and I also, I mean, I'm super into Storm Pilot too. Um, though I, it's harder to find fic from people like I, I with, as far as any fic with Finn in it as a main character, I only read fic from people that I trust or that's recommended by people that I trust because I'm so afraid of how he's going to be portrayed. Um, so I haven't read a lot of Storm Pilot or Finn Ray. So, um, but I really want to, and I've been writing sort of one, but yeah, there's I didn't my, know that. uh, whole Yay. Thing. yeah, it's, yeah, I don't know how long it's going to end up being, um, you know, and I have, a really great premise for it but so it'll probably be a long one shot but i don't know anyway so there's my there's my well ships you know it, it's funny that you should mention again the whole cousins thing because i also at, right after tfa came out really got into Raylo for a little while uh and some of it was spite because there there's been a lot of backlash against that particular ship and apparently now if you tell me not to do something i decide that i'm gonna do it <laughs> And wrote like 42,000 words worth of fic explaining exactly how I was going to do it with this particular ship. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the big argument that everyone had against it was, oh, my God, they might be cousins. To which I'm like, oh, honey. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that really, I was like, you know, if I'm willing to ship cousins and be like, whatever. I think what I, what my, what my mindset was, was I was like. Oh, yeah? You think they're cousins? Well, I'm going to write fic with their brother and sister, so there. And then never did. But then I went, wait a minute. If I'm going to be shipping brother and sister, there's the ship that's been like the ship of my heart for 40 years. <laughs> and I fell in hard. Um, so I am kind of an unrepentant Luke Leia shipper. Um, I, I have written a lot of fic where they don't know. 
And that's that was kind of my gateway drug of no, it's it, it's it's all fine because they don't know, it doesn't matter. Um, but I'm getting a little less shameless as time goes on in terms of what I read and what I write. Um, I didn't have any other Star Wars fix or any any other Star Wars ships before that, but then Tumblr, God damn it, Tumblr, kept throwing. Um, Han Luke at me in the form of gift sets of, of all these fantastic longing looks that these two throw each other over the course of three movies. Um, and so that kind of happened. Um, and so, of course, the logical explanation there is the OT3, which I adore. So, yeah, I'm trash. I admit it. Um, <sighs> I own it. Whatever. <laughs> so, I've said before that Obi-Wan is my favorite character. And so since I'm restricting myself to the prequels here pretty much any ship with obi-wan in it um now obviously the um the uh the prequels fandom kind of center tends to center around either qui-gon obi-wan or obi-wan anakin um there's a lot of anakin padme but it's a slightly different like it's like a venn diagram where the circles overlap a little bit um but the two big ships i would say are those two um but really, I kind of shipped Obi Wan with everyone. I mean, every they say every <laughs> fandom has a bicycle, and that was mine. Um, yeah, and it didn't it hurt. <laughs> it didn't hurt that he was played by Ewan McGregor in the first three movies, and Ewan McGregor did a lot of nudity when he was in his twenties. <laughs> and so, yeah, there was a lot of great references for various things. Um, the number of fix where Obi Wan goes undercover as a sex slave with like eyeliner and glitter <laughs> and tight black leather pants—I can't even tell you. Holy shit! Yeah, that, that's like its whole whole subgenre of Kyobi fic. Um, really amazing stuff. But I think that that sort of um, so the thing about Qui Gon Obi Wan is it's kind of it's like a juggernaut ship. You know, there are fandoms that have their juggernaut ships like Sherlock and stuff like that, and then there are fandoms like Harry Potter where there's just a lot of ships. And I think you know, the prequels tends to be kind of juggernauty like that. A lot of Qui Gon Obi Wan. Um, the the interesting thing about that is that. The half of that pairing died in the movie. Mm-hmm. So, right. like, before the fandom even started, one of the characters was dead. Character death warning. Um, so there's, like, there's sort of two sort of ca- general categories, in my opinion, of, of fic, at least from the early, late 90s, early 2000s. And that was fic that went back in time and looked at their relationship before the events of The Phantom Menace. And so that tends to be a lot of, like, teacher-student kind of stuff. Um P- fandoms back in that time period were really, really concerned about what we called Chan at the time, which is like underage stuff. So really everything tends to be like Obi-Wan in his late teens, early twenties. So it's more like college student advisor kind of a relationship than strictly <laughs> teacher student. It's not like, you know, that kind of thing. It's not Lolita esque, but it's, um, but so there's a lot of that. And so a lot of people find that a little bit squicky and there are, there's a big subgenre of fic where, uh, <laughs> where like masters have to sort of take guide their padawans through the sort of sexual initiation. There are so many things like that, and I can wreck you some if you're interested. But um, yeah, there's a lot of great stuff like that. Um, but then there's this other sort of um, set of fix where Qui Gon didn't die, and uh, and then they go on sort of as equals and and form a relationship after the events of the Phantom Menace. So there's there's lots of stuff. It's, it's huge. The best thing about Star Wars fanfic for me in general, is that it's just so wide open. There you have the whole universe. They can go anywhere. They can do anything. And the, oh my gosh, the number of fix where they have to go undercover and pretend to be someone they're not, or one of them goes <laughs> under their cover and the other one has to come and rescue them, or oh my god, it just goes on and on and on. Or the number of aliens that they can have sex with is just stunning. Like, that I mean, it starts to rival Star Trek fic in that way, like all the different configurations of genitalia that you can imagine. Um, there's just a lot of variety out there. It's a lot of fun. So I think that um, if anyone is interested, I can give you Rex. Um, there's a lot of <laughs> old stuff. There's been a resurgence in Qui Gon Obi Wan since The Force Awakens, and now it has a presence on Tumblr, which is amazing mm-hmm. to me. But so yeah, there's Tumblr. There's new fix being posted on Ao3. Like no, that, one that's yesterday. absolutely happened with the original trilogy fic too. Yeah, so it's really cool. So if you want to get into Qui Gon Obi Wan, I will. Um, I have some recs that I will pass the links on um, for the show notes, and or you can just go to Ao3 and just click on the tag and sort by kudos and see what comes up. <laughs> okay, so like I said, like uh, 
the EU fandom is just a mess when it comes to shipping. Uh, because, <laughs> well, there were so many books and there were so many writers doing it. And it was everybody had their opinions and they would use their books to like argue about who they wanted someone to end up with. <laughs> it particularly happened with Luke. <laughs> that makes me laugh so hard. And with uh, Jaina Solo. Um, uh, but yeah, Luke, they um, they kept on introducing women I- into the books that they were <laughs> hoping that he would end up with. And then they end up putting him with the first chick that they introduced into the book series. Um, which, you know, that was a way that they could go. But yeah. uh, <laughs> I actually, I never shipped Luke with anybody. I shipped Luke with becoming a monk, so... <gasps> That's a waste. That's a criminal waste. Oh, well, I sh- okay, I should explain it. I shipped him with becoming a monk in the books. Meanwhile, when I was writing fan fiction, dot, dot, dot. No, wait, because... you, have to, you have to finish that. Dot, dot, okay. dot. Okay, my dot, dot, dot. Um, I wrote horrible Mary Sue fix. Yes! Um, <laughs> and actually, with the whole Force Awakens thing where people are... Um, Suggesting that Ray might be Luke's kid with Obi Wan's daughter. I hate that theory because I wrote that fanfic <laughs> about 15 years ago. <laughs> See, this is the thing that makes me sad that I was not writing fanfic. Well, I was writing fanfic as an 11 year old, but for some reason it didn't occur to me to write Star Wars fanfic as an 11 year old. I don't yeah. know why not. Well, but I feel like I missed an opportunity to write horrible Mary Sue-esque fic of Star Wars. It's very sad. Some of my horrible Mary Sue fic is still on, you know, the bowels of the internet. So, you know, there's, you know, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, but Yeah, but see, in, when I was 11, there was no internet. So they would yeah. just be in notebooks somewhere that no one ever saw. They've disintegrated. <laughs> what I actually shipped... Um, I shipped um, Jason with Tanaka, which um, I had eventually ended up falling out of the EU fandom around the time they killed Chewbacca. I just couldn't deal with it anymore. <gasps> Sorry, spoiler alert. They killed off Chewbacca, and that was like, done. Uh, and I wouldn't be able to deal I ended with that. Up, yeah, it was, I just... I- I it was Chewbacca. Where, I read a fic once where they killed off Chewbacca, where he sacrificed himself for um, Kylo and Rey. And I was just like, why would you do that? Why? Yeah. <laughs> like, that's ex- pro- that's almost exactly what happened in the EU books. But yeah, anyways, when that happened, I stopped reading them. But then eventually, uh, but I started to get back into things. I'm like, oh my god, they actually got Jason and Ten Elka together. Oh, wait, no, things went really badly. He's evil now. He's evil now. Uh, And Jaina, who um, they did ship with, like, a million different people because everybody had their ideas to who she should be with. Um, Personally, I shipped her with Lobaka. She's Chewbacca's nephew. (laughs) (laughs) Because nobody else shipped her with Lobaka, so I wanted to be unique. Um... And I really liked Mara Jade and Lando, which was supposedly canon, but then when Timothy Zahn came back into the books and decided that he didn't like his um, uh, his special creation to be with anybody but Luke, decided that they were undercover at the time. I'm doing sarcastic air quotes. And they weren't actually having an affair. They were just making it look like they had an affair. It was it was a really sloppy retcon. But God, the EU is a mess. <laughs> it really I've forgotten was. a lot of this. <laughs> uh, but I li- I had liked them together. I thought they actually had a very good chemistry. But oh well. And then I have the crack ship of. Uh, and if anybody has any recommendations for this, please give them to me. Uh, Jason Solo and Kylo Ren. Aren't they the same person? Basically, basically yes. <laughs> You have your twin cest, I have mine. A subgenre of, like, Kylo Ren fic is the uh, Solo triplets fic, where it's Kylo Ren, Ben Solo, and Matt the Radar Technician are three different actual people in their triplets. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> and I know that... Yeah. And I know there is fic out there that is those three plus Ray. I don't know if they've put them with any of the other characters or not, but yeah. Well, um, you know, I know of at least one 
Anakin Vader fic, so <laughs> it's a thing. It's a thing. And I am dead certain, I have not looked for it, but I am dead certain that someone has written fic of Luke and his clone. That wouldn't surprise me. It's got to be out God, those clones. <laughs> so if I wanted to get into this, give me a good starting point. That one's actually really easy. It's Heir to the Empire. I, I think that book's totally overhyped, but, you know, that's the one you start with. <laughs> because, I mean, you could start with Truce of Akaroth, which is the one that takes place after Return of Jedi, but it's no good. Well, I would say the thing that you'd want to do immediately after watching The Force Awakens would be to read Bloodline. And, um, and, you know, and I haven't read them yet, but from what I understand, you know, um, oh my gosh, I totally just blanked on the name of it. The one with Sienna <laughs> Oh, Lost Stars, um, yes. Yes. So, after you read Bloodline, then I think Lost Stars, uh, from just everything that everybody's told me about it, since I haven't actually read it yet. Um, I have read so, it. I can highly recommend it. And I've sincerely enjoyed the Poe Dameron comics. I don't know if that is a good recommendation, because they're the first comic books I've ever read in my life. But yeah. I've enjoyed them. <laughs> so far, Disney's been pretty on point with all of the... Um, new i i don't want to call it expanded universe because it's not expanded universe it's just more canon but all of the books and the comics they've been pretty good with those um i've i've thoroughly enjoyed all of the ones that i've read so far i mean obviously for the original trilogy you start with a new hope i mean it, and of course you've already seen a new hope you've already seen all of them or else why are you listening to this podcast <laughs> um, yeah i i got no other answer for that yeah, I mean, you don't have to... If you want to read, like, Qui-Gon Obi-Wan fic, you don't actually have to go back and watch the movie. You don't have to endure two hours of Jar Jar fart jokes. Um, but what you can do <laughs> is you can scroll over to Tumblr, and uh, there's basically two tags um, where you're going to find stuff. Uh, Jen Obi, J-I-N-N-O-B-Y, is one of the tags. This is, this is a pairing name that I didn't know existed until today when I started asking some folks and one and uh, Helen over at the um, Yahoo group, which still exists from 19 from the 1990s um, told me that that's what it was called on Tumblr. That's the new label these days. Um, and also, and also obviously, um, okay. Jen Obi and, and Obi Kwai are sort of the two tags to search. And so you'll see lots of beautiful graphics and things. If you do that, um, I'm going to recommend um, some old fix. And if you want to see some newer stuff, you can just go over to AO3 and just jump right in. I, you know, if you like, undercover sex slaves if you like you know you and mcgregor and eyeliner if you like and who you know, doesn't gosh really? and who doesn't mm -hmm. like you and mcgregor and eyeliner really there's just a lot of great stuff out there so um uh i will po i'll send those recs on to the end of the show notes you can just dive right in you don't have to read or anything or rewatch anything just go for the porn it's great <laughs> I, I, I think my, my favorite tendency of fandom in general is the ability to put any character in eyeliner at any given moment. <laughs> I know that's one of my favorite tropes. I've definitely got I've definitely gotten Luke into eyeliner at least once, so Well Kylo Ren already wears it. I mean I don't know if it's actually a character thing. I mean his makeup it, like it's obvious they put eyeliner on him and gave him a smoky eye. Like it's just surreal obvious, but I don't know if that's kylo doing that or the um makeup artist but yeah so <laughs> kylo ren has his own makeup artist on the <laughs> star killer base okay somebody's got to fix that something that might be different about like uh the quiet obi or the obi annie kind of stuff or anything that involves like the prequels era old republic jedi is that you know there's this whole sort of idea that they were they had no attachments, right? And so yeah. they were hiding any feelings that they had or it was just sex and sex was considered just a, like a physical release or just something that you would do, but you would have no attachments. So there's a lot of really interesting exploration of this idea of sex without strings or um, that a sexual relationship is fine as long as you don't fall in love. And so there's a lot of wonderful angst. Oh, I was going to say, comes from that. Oh, <laughs> a lot of really great angst. And uh, uh, and uh, not intending to toot my own horn because this is not, there's nothing really to toot about. Um, but my one of my first forays into the fandom was a series that I co-wrote with a bunch of other people called Queer as Jedi, which was loosely based on Queer as Folk. 
um, where we took this idea of people who just had a lot of sex and tried not to get attached to anybody, and uh, and but we said it in the Star Wars universe, and it's it's so it's not even on Ao3, it's like got its own website. It's like really, but that that was like an example of the kind of stuff that people did, and some people actually did a much better job of it than I think we did with that particular series. But there's a lot of beautiful angst and beautiful exploration of what of how fucked up those people were, right? I mean, so I think that maybe it's a unique thing that you don't, maybe you don't see in other pieces of the Star Wars fandom is that you have this whole Jedi code thing and these strange relationships between masters and apprentices and what that might mean. Yeah. I think by, uh, by our current era, we just kind of went, whatever Jedi code, who cares? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'd like to thank Emma and April. And of course, MC as always uh, for this round table. I, I am literally dying of nostalgia now um <laughs> and i'm looking forward to seeing all these fic wrecks that you guys come up with because i have some reading to do so we'll see you guys next month Welcome to our fan work rec segment. This month we're doing something a little different and we're going to be hearing recs from me, MC, Emma, and April. For my original trilogy rec, I am skipping past any semblance of plot and going straight for the smut. This is Luke Leia smut, so if that's not your thing, you can skip ahead now. I am highly recommending Taboo by Mistress Quickly. That's Mistress with a three instead of an E. It is, in case the title didn't clue you in, a Han Luke Leia fic that deals with Luke and Leia coming to terms with finding out that they're siblings after they've already been in a relationship together and also with Han. There are several subgenres of Luke Leia and Luke Leia Han fic. You have the ones that are set pre Return of the Jedi, where they don't know that they're siblings. You have the ones where they angst over being siblings and decide to part or decide to never act on their feelings. And you have the ones where they know and decide they don't care. Taboo is a combination of two and three. The story starts out with Han and Luke together the night of the Battle of Endor, and Luke is trying to come to terms with the revelation about Leia. Han, ever helpful as he so often is in these stories, doesn't see what the big deal is, and thinks the twins should stay together. He spends most of the story trying to convince them. Spoiler alert, he succeeds. Now, here's the point with a fic reg, where I'd normally read you an excerpt, except I can't, because there is just that much smut going on in this fic. But don't let the smuttiness fool you, though. There are layers and layers of feelings going on here, and in addition to being astonishingly hot, there's a thread of sadness that runs through the story as well. At 10,000 words... Taboo is a PWP with a lot of heart hiding inside it, so get ready for some smut and some feels. There are many types of fan works around. While this segment focuses a lot on fan fiction, we will also be profiling other works in fandom. This particular one is a video series on YouTube. Star Wars Minute by Star Wars Explained posts a new video every weekday explaining some aspect of Star Wars lore. Nothing is ignored. Both legends and canon are given time. Here is a clip explaining the legend of the Cantina Band, Friggin' Dan, and the modal nodes. Shortly before the Battle of Yavin, the band entered into a contract with Jabba the Hutt. After learning of Jabba's habit of executing his underlings, the band began to regret that decision. They took a job with one of Jabba's rivals, Lady Valerian, playing at her wedding in order to make enough money to escape Tatooine and Jabba. With so much new canon coming out and a large amount of contradictory legends, Star Wars Explained helps fans find out what they need to know one minute at a time. Hello, Trash Compactor podcast listeners. I'm Emma Grant, and I'm here to share with you some fic wrecks from the prequels era fandom. Everything I'm going to wreck today is fairly old, from back in the early 2000s. But since most of these aren't on AO3, I suspect that they're not all that easy for people to come across when they're looking for fics in this fandom. I should also note that most of these wrecks contain slash and explicit sexual content, so take that either as a warning or an enticement. Most of what I'm wrecking today focuses on the Qui-Gon Obi-Wan ship, but I actually want to start with the Prince and the Padawan series by Jedi Rita. 
It begins when Obi-Wan is still a Padawan learner and meets Bail Organa, a dashing young prince and junior senator from Alderaan who has a reputation as a party boy. But of course, he turns out to be a lot more interesting than Obi-Wan expected. It's a lovely slow burn, and then the story follows their relationship over the next few decades through Obi-Wan training Anakin and beyond. The series is posted on the Master Apprentice Archive, and as with all of these wrecks, you can find the link in the show notes. So most fic from the prequels era centers around a few ships, Qui-Gon Obi-Wan, Obi-Wan Anakin, and of course, Anakin Padme. There were obviously many other ships, but those were the big ones. I preferred reading Qui-Obi, and so most of my wrecks today are going to center on that pairing. Apologies in advance, but if you have wrecks for another ship that you'd like to share, please send them to this podcast, and I'm sure that they'll pass them on. The more, the merrier where fic wrecks are concerned. One of my favorite subgenres in Kwiobi fic is the undercover mission. There are just so many possibilities, so many roles for the characters to play, and so many ways for them to discover their feelings for each other. I have four wrecks to offer you. The first is Pleasure Boy by Augusta Pembroke. In this story, Kwai and Obi go undercover as a duke and his contracted pleasure boy in order to determine who is responsible for the abuse of sex workers. And of course, playing the role takes them to a place they hadn't expected to go. One of the things that I really enjoy about this story is the respect with which sex workers are viewed in this universe. This is something I find special about the Star Wars universe in general, that fanfic writers have space, (laughs) haha, no pun intended, to play with sexual norms and mores and to imagine how differently those could look outside the context of the heteronormative hegemony of our society. In L'Histoire d'Obi, or The Story of Obi, sorry for my horrific French accent there, by Lilith Sedai, Kwai and Obi go undercover as a master and slave. The mission requires Obi-Wan to submit to his master in almost every way imaginable, and yeah, that means what you think it does. Obi has to go to some dark places in this story, and he learns a lot about himself in the process. The Red Temple by Rushlight is probably the most well-known of all the Obi-Wan Goes Undercover as a Sex Slave fix. In order to solve the mystery of the fate of a governor's missing son, Obi-Wan has to sell himself into sexual slavery. He sinks into the role in ways that he never expected. As a warning, there are fairly graphic depictions of non-consensual sex in the story. Non-con is usually a big squick for me, but I thought it was handled really well in this one. So while I definitely recommend it, it can get fairly dark, so proceed with caution. And finally, if it's not too gauche, I'd like to point you toward my own contribution to the undercover fic genre, The Bodyguard. The summary is a slaver, a bodyguard, a Jedi, and a secret. Just add sex. Okay, so now you probably think this is going to be a one-note rec list, or that all Kwai Obi fic is undercover sex slave stuff, but it's not, I promise. I have more recs. In 20 Questions by Annie Carr and Nancy Alexander, Kwai and Obi are trapped together in a house for a month, and they have to find some way to pass the time. This fic is funny and sexy and ultimately romantic. A Matter of Control by Annalise is a great mission fic in which Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan search for a missing Jedi and, of course, get closer along the way. Kampai Segundo by Gloriana is a fascinating example of the ways that fics in this fandom explore different ways of thinking about sex and relationships. The premise of the story is that part of Jedi training includes ritualized sex between a master and apprentice. This turns out to be a lot more difficult for Qui and Obi than either of them expected. No collection of fic wrecks from this era would be complete without the fandom classic Riding the Wheel of If by Mrs. Hamill. In this epic series, Obi-Wan searches multiple universes to find Qui-Gon after the events of the Phantom Menace. He finds him in many different places, making this an incredible collection of AU fics, all connected by the thread that, no matter what reality they're in, Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan are destined to be together. And finally, I'll throw out something completely different. Queer as Jedi was an AU series based loosely on Queer as Folk. It's basically a crazy space soap opera that covers a lot of different pairings, all based on the central premise that Jedi are encouraged to be sexually promiscuous as long as they never, ever develop emotional attachments. And of course, that's the hard part. In the interest of full disclosure, I was one of the writers of this series, but I enjoyed it as a reader too back in the day, so hopefully my wreck isn't too horribly self-serving. There's a lot of prequels era fic on AO3, some new and some old, so I encourage you to go and check the tags for The Phantom Menace and for the various ships over there to find new things. 
It's harder to leave kudos and comments on these older fics, but if you read any of these recs and enjoy them and don't have an easy way to let the author know, I hope you'll consider paying it forward by making a rec post of your own. Happy reading! The amnesia fic is a tried and true trope in the realm of fanfiction, but not one I've delved into very often. But as I was checking out the work of fic author ambiguously after reading their Sex, Paul, and Raylo fic on Beds of Asphodel, I came across Seldom All They Seem. The summary is simple. After a terrible accident, Ray wakes up to discover she doesn't remember the last five years. Normally I might pass such a fic by, but ambiguously had me hooked with Beds of Asphodel with their lush world building and emotional yet delightfully dirty smut. So I gave it a chance, and it delivered. In Seldom All They Seem, Ray wakes up not only unable to remember the last five years, but to learn she's married to her mortal enemy, Kylo Ren, now using his birth name, Ben. She's convinced it's a trick at first, then convinced it's a dream. Soon, though, Ray wakes up in what she considers to be the present and begins visiting the dream world at night. As she switches between the world where she's married to Ben Solo and the world she last remembered, the audience is no longer sure either of what's real and what's a dream, especially when one of Ray's most earnest desires is fulfilled in the future. Is it a dream? If it is, is it Ray's or Kylo Ren's? The fic is delicately structured and the author's characterizations are rich, especially her treatment of Finn and his relationships with Ray and Poe. Ben Solo is a beautiful balance of frustration and longing, with his darkness barely simmering underneath. Seldom All They Seem is a work in progress, but it updates regularly, and I have full faith it will be completed. Check it out and take a look at the author's other work to bide your time between updates. But I'm a 90s bitch. I love it. So that's episode number two of the Trash Compactor podcast. We hope you had as much fun as we did. Huh? It was uh, definitely about as chaotic as I was expecting. <laughs> yes, definitely. Well, we were just blown away by the response that we had to our first episode. You guys have been amazing. And we we asked you guys to contact us to let us know what you thought. And you did. The overwhelming response was that you like the transcripts. So we will keep typing away and doing those. And we also got one, we got fan mail, yeah. literally fan Yay. mail on Tumblr, um, which I would like to share because it made me very, very happy. We got a message from the Loneliest Shipper on Tumblr. Hello, the Loneliest Shipper. Hello. I hope, you're, hope you're listening. They wrote, the first episode was so good. I've tried and abandoned a number of Star Wars podcasts and five minutes into this one, I knew I was home. You didn't, you all did an amazing job. Well done. Thank you so Thank much. You. The, the, the whole feeling like this is home like that's exactly what i think we're going for. oh yeah definitely we want that mm -hmm. that fandom culture that we're oh yeah about. This, this is this is what we want to try to yeah. recreate so yay. yay so if you want to drop us a line feel free to if you don't want us to read your message on the air just add a note in it and we won't but otherwise you're fair game sorry you can drop us a line on tumblr at trash compactor podcast dot tumblr dot com or on Twitter at SW Trash Podcast, at our website at trashcompactorpodcast.com, or through email at the trash compactor podcast at gmail.com. So next month, we're looking forward to talking about another favorite character of ours. Yeah, we will be talking about all things Ray. Uh, we're going to Yay. delve into the book before the awakening. We'll get into some meta and possibly some shipping and definitely oh, going to be some shipping. Definitely <laughs> theories, including who we think Ray is. Aside from, you know, awesome. Yes. I mean, that goes without saying, and we'll probably be repeating that a lot anyways. <laughs> So uh, join us next month, the first Monday in August, and we'll talk about Ray. Until then, I'm MC. I'm Rune. <laughs> Rune.